All right, we're going to get started. Welcome, it's 1 p.m. Um, this is Advanced Kentucky's AP Calculus AB mock exam scoring session. We are glad you can be here today. Um, first thing is happy Teachers Appreciation Week. I know we've got teachers from, I think, 30 states and four countries joining us, so welcome to everyone. Uh, we're glad you can be here. So um, before we get started, please make sure you go to the bit.ly link that you see on your screen, bit.ly slash mock exam 2020. That is where we have posted all materials that will be needed for today. Um, a lot of the things you, you might feel like you need to take notes, but don't worry because all of those will be included in the briefing slides that are being shown today. Um, so make sure you've got those in front of you. Next, uh, this session is intended for Kentucky audience, but like I said, we've got plenty of people in here, so we welcome all of you. Um, we will do everything we can to provide you with a, a great experience to learn just a little bit about how the actual reading goes. Um, but anyone causing a disruption will be removed. Also, um, College Board and ETS have both not had any role in the development of these materials or what's going to be said today. Um, so all of what we're saying is speculative, so just take that with a grain of salt. Next, uh, Advanced Kentucky is happy that you can be here. Give us a follow on our Twitter, Facebook handle. Uh, my name is Aaron Timmons. I'm the Content Director for Mathematics. Feel free to reach out to me with any follow-up questions after today. Um, Alex and Michael will both share their information as well. So for, uh, for the duration of today's session, the microphones will be off and we ask that you leave your videos off as well. Um, the chat feature at the bottom right-hand corner of your Zoom screen can be used to uh, send questions directly to me. Um, I'll be posing questions to people um, throughout or to Alex and Michael with uh, specific grading questions as they come up, but um, that will be the extent of our uh, communication online here for right now anyways. If you do want to note that we have nonverbal feedback buttons, if you find the participant screen uh, on your Zoom window, there, there are um, select buttons at the bottom. You can use those to indicate preferences about yes, no, you need people to uh, go slower, uh, speed up, any of the above. Feel free to use those as well. KYAP2020.com is where today's recording will be posted. So if you are not able to stay for the entire session or if you want to rewatch it, you can find that recording on that website. Uh, should be posted by the end of the day, hopefully, if not first thing tomorrow morning. All right, so that does it for me. A couple other things, please make sure you move to speaker view. There's no reason you wanna see uh, 182 right now. We have 82 people in here. We don't wanna see 82 blank boxes. So keep it on speaker view. That will make it uh, most relevant for you. Um, questions, like I said, can be directed directly to me. I will pose those questions to Michael and Alex throughout the time. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Michael and Alex, and they will take it away. Hello. Hey. Uh, here, let me click on the screen. There we go. So, Michael? <laughs> oh, uh, I'm Michael Marshall. I've taught calculus at Scott County High School in Georgetown, Kentucky for many years, about 13. I also work at Advanced Kentucky uh, with the middle school program, and I've been a reader for five years. And this year, I'm going to be a table leader for the just uh, online grading. So we'll see how that goes. Aaron? Yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, <laughs> my, my name is Aaron Timmons. Again, I'm the content director for Advanced Kentucky. Um, a former AP reader and former AP calculus teacher for both AB and BC. And uh, I'm Alex McAllister. I actually started, uh, I, I teach at Center College. I'm a math professor here. Um, I started great exams when I first started at Center in 2020 and they, they keep bringing me back, which is, has been an honor and a pleasure. Um, done stuff, table leader, question leaders. The, the last couple of years I've been an exam leader. Um, and so they, the College Board and ETS kindly let agreed that we could we could go ahead and do this this presentation for y'all today um, the, the goals of the session that we want to share are the the goals to, to share a fair consistent roadmap to assigning credit and this is true at every single AP reading um, if you can imagine trying to get 500 people to a grade students papers consistently that um, it, it takes a lot of work and effort and there's a lot of choices that have to get made there um, I don't know, sometimes I walk down the hallway here and I'll, I'll show an exam paper and a colleague and I will disagree about whether one point should count or not. And I, I think that certainly happens in the reading. Uh, that, right, all of us love calculus, all of us love our students, 
And sometimes we have to compromise a little bit um, in terms of to try and create the consistency piece. Um, the, the, I mean, the, the, the thing around that is, is right, we, we do have to give up a little bit of that autonomy because it's really the college board or EPS that's creating it. It's, it's not us as individuals. Um, you should know a lot of thoughts gone into it. I think what we're gonna share today is what would be shared with table leaders in the pre-reading basically, where um, the, two, the three of us have, have basically tried to pull something together um, that, that is our, our best guesses at how some things might work. Um, but like you said, there's, there, there's no insider info on your, this year's tests or test scores or any of that stuff. These are, these are our personal impressions about how an exam might run and be graded. Um, and then we have some fun along the way here too. Just we love calculus, right? So, so let's have some blast talking some math. I don't know, Michael, do you want to add in a little bit more about that or? Yeah, I, I was hoping today that you could get a little taste of what it's like when you go to the reading because I, I know as a teacher, you just see the scoring guide and you're like, okay, that's it. And your kids ask a million questions and you're like, well, it says this. When you go to the reading, there's an hour, hour and a half briefing on the question. The scoring guide is just like the perfect solution, but you, you hear all kinds of things and you have to calibrate and make sure you're consistent. So there's a lot that goes behind it, not just the scoring guide. So that's what I want you to get out of today is how that kind of feels. So, so our plan is we're gonna talk through AB1 and grade some AB1, talk through AB2 and grade some AB2 and then wrap up with any questions. I think we're gonna have space for questions mixed in as we go along. So, so hopefully you all have, have seen the question or, or you can look at it um, through the to the bit.ly link. Um, the, the first question, how's it set up? We, we're given a graph of a function and we're, we're getting synonyms, right? We've got the graph of G, we've got that it's the derivative of the function F, and they're told different things about it, right? That it's twice differentiable in the interval. We, we, we reassure the students that there's horizontal tangents at those couple places that look like they might have them. Um, and then we give them some area information. Um, and, then we, and then we dive into all kinds of questions you can answer with calculus, right? Find X coordinates where we've got a local minimum and justify your answer. Find X coordinates where there's a point of an inflection. On, and we've, we've actually shrunk the interval a little bit there in, in, in how we, we, we set up this question. Um, we'll see how we work with that. And again, justify your answer. Um, and, then, and then there's a shift to, to some calculus that, that's more, more integration oriented, right? Asking them to write an expression for the value of the function on this interval, right? If we've got, an, uh, if we've got some initial condition that goes with it, and then use this expression to find the values of f of zero and f of 10. Um, part D is to evaluate a limit, and right there, there's some L'Hopital's action that's going to happen in that one. And then part H is finding substantive lines. So we're back to doing derivatives and thinking about chain rules again. So, all right, so let's go ahead and dive into AB1A, where there's a scoring guideline. So, so we made the guess that right, if we've got 60% on part um, on the first question and 40% on the second question that we're gonna get 15 points in the first question and 10 points in the second. Um, now maybe that'll happen, maybe it won't, but that was kind of how we thought about uh, setting up, walking through these five different parts of this question. So part A, we gave it two points and we wanted the students to identify X equals six as that local minimum. Um, and then we're gonna be looking for a justification, right? Looking for something about F prime or G or the graph changing from negative to positive. And so that's how we'll think about um, awarding credit on this, on this part. Um, so the identify X equals six, um, we're thinking about that as a potential answer. So, so you might imagine it would show up in a list of, of other values, right? right? Minimums, you could think about other critical points or um, be thinking about the endpoints. If, if there's other points that they highlight, um, I start listing all the integers or things like that, they won't earn the second point. Um, they, but, um, but they could, yeah, yeah, they, as long as it appears on this limited list. And then we're asking about just X coordinates. Sometimes students might put down ordered pairs. So we're not gonna look at the Y coordinates. We're just gonna focus in on the X coordinates. So there's a, that little bit of a, 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 a choice there in, in choosing to be a little bit generous. In, in how we might read some things where students are in the ballpark but, are, but, but could be a little bit off. Um, the second point for justification, so what are we looking for there? We need the students to identify x equals six as the local minimum. Um, I, meant, I mentioned allow implicit, you might just see a statement x equals six 
right? Well, what was the prompt is to identify the minimum. So if we just see that, we'll, we'll think about that as them identifying that as our minimum. Um, and they have to give an acceptable reason um, in either order, right? We might see the reason and then, right, they're telling us what they're thinking and then what their conclusion is is x equals six. Or maybe they just say up front x equals six and then, and then talk about why. Um, either order is, is certainly just fine. Um, so I wanted to show you some acceptable reasons, um, right, G going from negative to positive, um, or those abbreviations with the minus and the, the plus signs. Um, we, we might see, right, we've told them that the that G is the, um, the derivative of the function F. So we've created a synonym for them in the stem of the questions. So maybe it's F prime um, or the slope of F. Um, we will allow them to say the graph changes from negative to, to positive there because there's only one graph given in this picture. The graph is, is pretty identifying in, in this case. Um, you might also see them talk about this in terms of uh, right, using words to articulate what's going on and, and think about almost kind of a the description of reading from left to right. That would be another way that a student could talk about, um, give their justification for why we have a local minimum. Unacceptable reasons. So we also need to acknowledge those. Um, maybe F, right, they might say F changes from decreasing to increasing. So, well, that is what happens at a, at a minimum by definition. So, so we need them actually to see them using the information that they're given in the question. Um, they might reference function, derivative, slope, and not mention whether they're talking about G or F. We've got a couple functions that have been named and identified here. If they're gonna refer to those things. They, Right, it's their obligation to communicate and, and be more specific about, well, which function, which derivative are they talking about? Um, just, just two more things here, right? One too many derivatives, we might see the student talking about the slope of F prime, when really they need to be talking about F prime or the slope of F. Um, and then there, you right, imagine there might be other insufficient, vague, irrelevant, incorrect reasons. So, so different things that could happen there. Um, so, so we'll be looking for these acceptable reasons with, for, for a justification. All right, so a big part of ca calibrating is that we practice scoring student samples. So sometimes we just have snips of just parts. So we wanna practice that. Aaron, do you have a poll for this one? I do, and, and these polls are all anonymous. We want everybody to participate. So please, uh, please do your best here. So Aaron's gonna put up a poll and give you a real quick amount of time. How much do you wanna give, Aaron? 15 seconds. Okay, 15 seconds. All right, we did 20. All right, good. So this one shows that students don't have to write three paragraphs. This is clear and concise. Like we said, x equals six, we ask for a minimum because f prime, which is g, changes from negative to positive. They score a one, one. Good. Polls up. All right. This one, they say the relative min at x equals six, they write out more and they say the graph of G changes from sine to negative to positive. In this particular problem, it's all right to just say G. They don't have to identify that F prime equals G because we said in the stem that it was the derivative. However, sometimes you have to make sure your students say that if it's not expl explicitly given, like in those fun when you do the fundamental theorem and you take the derivative of an integral function. But for this one, it's good. So this is also a one, one. Next. Okay, the student said there's a local min at x equals two because f prime goes from positive to negative. 
they cannot earn the justification without x equals six. So this is a zero, zero. And the last one. All right, this is a common thing you'll see. Uh, they've identified x equals six, but then they tell us that uh, it would decrease then increase making a value. That's the definition of a minimum. They haven't used calculus. So this is gonna be a one zero. They did not get the justification point. And that's it for the SNPs for that one. So I think we're gonna check Aaron. Was there, was there a question or two? us to talk about? No, the, the only question that came through was about um, needing to include g equals f prime, but you addressed that, so we are good to go. All right. All right, so let's go on to AB1 part B. So in this part of the question, the students are asked to find the x coordinates for each point of inflection, and now we ask them to look at this in open interval from 0 to 10. Um, yeah, actually, there was a point when we were a couple of weeks back, we, we knew we had to switch things up and how we usually do things. It's like, well, do we include 10 or 11 or not? Um, I'm sure the test development team has, has thought about this things carefully, and they'll, they'll come up with good stuff for us from the real version. We, we decided to um, write for the, thinking about this as a development thing for students, that um, we, we, we elected not to include that, that last part of the interval. We just focused from 0 to 10. Um, again, choices to make. Um, so, so in this case, right, the two answers are x equals 4 and x equals 8. And we, we decided we wanted three points in this part of the question. And so we, we decided to split this up, have them identify one of x equals 4 or x equals 8. Um, so think about can they identify at least one point where there, there's a point of inflection and then justify that one that they've given, okay? And then we went ahead and bundled the second one together. Um, so if they picked x equals four and justified it to earn the first two points to get that, that next point, they have to do x equals eight and justification together. Um, sorry, so let's talk through again how we're gonna right, think about each of these different points. Um, right, we want them to find one of x equals four or equals eight. Um, again, we'll, we'll allow it to appear in a list of other values similar to, to what we did a minute ago, um, the endpoints or that, that other actual what happens to be a point of inflection. Um, and then if ordered pairs, again, the, the stem of the question mentions x coordinates. So we're just going to, to look at those if, if ordered pairs show up. Um, all right, and the justification, all right, so, so they have to have earned the third point. If, if you haven't said x equals four or x equals eight, you don't have anything to justify. And so, right, they, they have to have at least identify one of the two points of inflection that are, are inside the interval that we've given them. Um, so, sorry, so what would be acceptable to reasons? So, so at this x coordinate, whichever one of them they picked, um, we might um, see them talk about things like g changing from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. Um, g prime changing from positive to negative or vice versa. Um, f double prime changing signs. So again, remember in this context, g and f prime are synonyms. Um, so they might, they might talk about the graph has a local extrema. So that would be a, another way that, that we'll think about as having an acceptable reason. Um, we will allow students to misspell inflection. I think infection is a, is a common misspelling, maybe more so now than in other times. Um, and then, right, the abbreviations of POI or IP for point of inflection or inflection point are things that, that we'll allow students to do. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, somehow we, we like people to write out everything, right? You can imagine the stress of the test. Here's a little space where we can give a little bit of generosity and grace and allow the students to earn points for, for what are pretty common abbreviations. Um, unacceptable reasons. So, so things like F changes concavity, um, right? So again, we might be thinking about definitional statements. Um, G changing directions. There's a lot of different ways G can, can change directions and it, it doesn't necessarily indicate a point of inflection. Um, references to the, the derivative being zero or having horizontal tangents, um, slope changing direction, the graph changing direction. Um, we, we need a little bit more than just changes of direction that uh, 
right? You can imagine a curve doing an S thing, right? That's a change in direction that doesn't break the, again, that, the graph changing direction is different than saying it has a local extrema. That's, that's a little more precise and has some more information inside there. Sorry, so those are some of the boundaries we'll look at between acceptable and unacceptable reasons for, for justifications that we'll see from students for that fourth point. Um, so the fifth point is putting it together for the other point of inflection. So if they've identified x equals four or x equals eight that didn't earn the third point, right, whichever one they haven't mentioned, and then they have to provide the, the corresponding justification. We'll still think, right, that same thing about ordered pairs, read only x coordinates. Um, at this point, if they've mentioned any values before eight or 10, they have to rule them out to earn this point um, that, right, if they mentioned endpoints or other values. Um, Right, we'll still allow 10 to stay in there and allow them to earn that fifth point. If they do link justifications, so they talk about x equals four, here's the reason why, x equals eight, here's the reason why, or the justification. The, those link justifications have to be correct. And, and we're gonna extend that to if they talk about x equals 10, if they say a false thing about x equals 10, then they, they won't be eligible to earn this fifth point. Um, and then just a side note here, right, that, that a thing we'll see along the way is, Third, fourth, and fifth points can all be earned in one sentence. It's possible that, that the whole package will come together in, in one sentence for the student. Okay. All right, snips. All right, here's our first snip. Aaron, get the poll. All right, so um, the poll's gonna come up. If those of you that said that the poll blocked your answers, you can move the poll window off to the side. So we'll give a few extra seconds though. You should be able to drag that off to the side there if, if you uh, cannot see the responses. We'll take about 20 seconds. All right, so on this one, the student has said F has an inflection point X equals four, eight, because F prime changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. This is actually, they got both points, four and eight. So that's a one and the justification is correct for both. So it's a one, one, one. Students can, if they put four and eight together, they can just say increasing, decreasing or decrease, increasing or vice versa. They don't have to match them up as long as they keep them together like that. All right, next. Here the students correctly identified that there's an inflection point, IP is okay at X equals four. And then the justification with that is correct because G increases then decreases, but they're missing the X equals eight. So they're gonna get the a first point, the second point, but not the third. So it's a one, one, zero. This student's identified that there's inflection points at X equals four and eight, and they said F double prime changes signs. That is acceptable. They cannot say F double prime equals zero, but if F double prime changes signs, there are points of inflections on F. So this is a one, one, one. All right, on this one, you can see how they have separated them out. So you have to check, is, is, is the G decreasing and increasing at four? Yes, at eight, increasing and decreasing. And then they've thrown in 10. And we've shown a little grace. We'll say we're we're going to ignore the 10 as long as they justify it correctly. And they did. G is decreasing and increasing. So we're just going to ignore that. They didn't say anything wrong. It's a one, one, one. 
Yeah, and I guess just to mention, right, if they had said x equals 10, g is increasing then decreasing, then, then they would not earn that third point, right? Whatever that justification is has to be correct. So we got to do a little bit of reading there just to make sure. Any questions, Aaron? We have a couple. Um, I think uh, between what you all are talking, so correct me or, or just say if you already addressed it. Uh, if the interval went to 11, 10 would be included. That's correct. Um, POI is an acceptable abbreviation? Yes. All right, and then two questions that might require a little bit more of an explanation. Um, if are students usually expected to explain why they are not considering an endpoint? I'll let Alex address that. Yeah, so in, in the, um, I guess so the way we frame the question here, we're working on an open interval. And so, um, right, I, I think just a, just a reference to, right, the, the, the stem of the question asking them to work on an open interval would be the, the explanation why we wouldn't be looking at this endpoints. Um, I, I don't know if they got, I'm trying to, I can't think of a question where you've been asked a point of inflection on a closed interval where it's at an endpoint. I'm not, so I'm not thinking of what a version of that would look like. I think that may have applied a little bit more to part 1A, but, but regardless, I, I think just the question in general. Yeah. Yeah, so I think simply a reference to, I, I think I'm, I, hopefully I'm getting at the question that, that the questions have been asked on open intervals. And so if somebody mentions endpoints, but then says, oh wait, that's not on my open interval, not on the interval of the question, that'd be a fine way to exclude that as a candidate. And then I wanna add it on that. I think if you're talking about back to question one, I know there's always, do you count a local maximum min at an endpoint or not? And that's a, that depends on your text points textbook so uh college board is not gonna that's not gonna come up so a lot of times you'll see open intervals for that reason so that it's not going to be a local max and min because it's on an open interval i would say that that is a piece of a thing that comes up in discussions in in the pre-readings is right well what are calculus books saying um we don't want a student disadvantaged because of a, of a textbook um similar for calculators the the uh rates Questions are often, solutions are often computed, right, when it's calculator active in, in the past, then we use lots of different calculators so that that technology isn't going to determine as best we can tell whether a student gets a, a point or not. So. And then the last, last question here, which I think was a good one. Um, someone says that they have their students mark up the graphs with words like increasing, decreasing, concave up, concave down. Does that count as a justification? So if the student indicates we should be looking up there, right? You can say, right, draw a big right? Because this was in part B, it's in the bottom part. Of, um, so, so we're gonna look at samples in a minute here. Um, let, me, let me just throw up uh, sample one for a minute, right? This part B that we're talking about is down in the bottom part and they've written that increasing, decreasing. You draw some kind of big arrow up there that, that's telling you to look up there, it might. <laughs> um, I think that usually we don't look at the graphs to give us that information. I think, I think that's some great pre-analysis. What do we want to see down in part B? Is then, right, what are the relevant parts off that graph to that part of the question? Um, so I want to see some, usually, almost, I, I, almost always I want to see some repetition of that pre-analysis down in that, the relevant part of the question. Does that, does that sound right from what you, you talked about, Mike? I agree, yeah. I, I, I would encourage kids to mark the graphs up, but like you said, repeat what they said, don't trust it. I see that a lot on the Riemann sum problems. Yeah. Yeah. Do I look at the rectangles? Do they want me to? That, and that's always real nuanced and it depends on the reading. It depends on what they decide. So I would be safe, mark on it, but also explain what you're doing. Yeah. All right, that was it. All right. All right, so let's go on to part C. So, so we're going to shift to a little bit of uh, integral calculus here. They've been given this initial condition of f of 2 equals 5 and asked to write down an expression for the value of f of x on the interval 0 to 11 that involves an integral. Um, and so right, what are we looking for? Them, them to recognize that, that g is the derivative of this function f. Right? So if I'm trying to get it f, I need to, to see an integral involved, right? the anti-differentiation. Um, and so, so our first point is, is going to be a more conceptual looking at an integrand. Um, do, do they understand that part of the fundamental theorem? Um, and then the second point is, 
do they have the correct expression, or I should say a correct expression for f of x? Um, and then the rest of the question says, right, use that expression to find the values of f of zero and f of 10 and show your work. And so, right, there's a whole lot of work over there on the left that, it, that right, just showing what it takes to get to f of zero and f of 10. Um, right, there's shorter versions, and we'll talk about how shorter versions of that can, can still earn points. Um, yeah, so I guess I already mentioned, right, this integrand point, it's a conceptual point. Um, we'll be looking to see one of f prime of t, f prime of x, g of t, g of x appearing in a definite integral. Um, right, we've already talked about how g and f prime are synonyms, so we'll let them use either one of those function names. Um, I, I, right, having x as a dummy variable and in the integral, um, when we're probably going to be looking at a limit of x, I, I share the concern about multiple uses of x, um, but, but we're going to, I guess this is another place where we're going to read a little bit more gently with the student, maybe tilt their head a little sideways when we look at that x to turn it into a t. Um, but, but we're going to allow either one of those and how we choose to read this, this conceptual point. Um, it's got to be a definite integral. So, so we'll talk more about bounds on the definite integral in the moment, but uh, it, it, it can be um, right, things like 2 to 11 or, or things like 2 to x. Um, so it actually, yeah, so for the expression point, we really are going to be looking for that right, that x is that upper limit of integration in almost everything. Are they using that initial condition paired with that lower limit um, with that f prime and that integral, right? So putting it all together to get a value for, or an expression for, for f of x on that interval. Um, the next one is just, a, right, again, that f prime and g are the synonyms and us being generous and allowing the use of, of t or x as, as a variable inside that integral. Um, yeah, this the second bullet point with the double x's bothers me a little bit, but but we're gonna we're gonna let the student earn the point in that context. We also need to point out the students can, if they want to, work not explicitly with the initial condition in that expression, but work with other points. So the the we gave them information about areas that that's now become relevant, and and we might see a student that has a a lower limit of zero and works with um, one plus on the front instead. Um, and so as long as they have that f of b that's correct, they do have a correct expression for f of x, and, and that, that should allow them to earn that point. I've offered up here, right, with those points, 0, 2, 6, and 10, what would be the f that we would expect to see? Um, and then the last point is expression for f of x. So, so if a student write down this whole thing, right, this piecewise expression for for f of x. So, um, so my understanding is the student actually did write this down. This isn't just us being clever and thinking of other ways to do it, but, but we've got some clever students out there who come up with good insights and ideas. And so, right, what are we looking for is that split usually, right, if we're working with that initial condition f of 2 equals 5, that split at 2, and then paying attention to, right, the positive or the negative corresponding to whether you're to the left or the right of the x-coordinate of that initial condition. Um, so these will be the kinds of things we're looking for in our expression for f of x to earn that seventh point. For the eighth point, um, we want to share that th this can be earned. We're looking for f of 0 equals 1 and f of 10 equals 4. These can be earned without the previous points. Um, so we'll see how that can happen. Um, they have to have both values correct and they have to be labeled. We can't just see 1 and 4 sitting on the page there. Um, but there's, there's also has to be supporting work. Um, people talk about no bald answers. Again, right, that you can't just write down f of 0 equals 1 and f of 10 equals 4, that we need to see some evidence of how they reach those conclusions. Um, and so we'll, we'll see examples of those kinds of things in the SNPs here in a minute. Um, oh, and then the last point, all right, you can imagine somebody might have an incorrect expression that that somehow manages to produce f of 0 equals 1 and f of 10 equals 4. That, right, that, that can't earn the points, right? We need to see that some, some correct work has read to the, the correct answer. Um, okay. All right, so let's go on to, oh, that's right. I'm sorry, I forgot. We have to talk about missing differentials. So, so I don't know about you, but sometimes my students leave off DTs. Um, that, well, so, so we have to figure out what do we do in that context? And so, so what we're gonna do is, is split this into two possibilities. If we see that expression for f as the five plus the two x, f prime of t dt, 
um, right? The, the convention would be to go ahead and think about going ahead and putting the, the DT right here, right? If I'm reading that, I'm assuming there's a DT living in that spot and we'll allow the students to earn those points. Um, it's not great communication. I, I really want my students to write that down, but here's a space where we're gonna let them have uh, a little bit of grace, um, as Michael mentioned. On the other hand, this other case where we've got the integral on the front and the plus five on the back end, we've got a couple places, right, that you know, maybe our, oops, maybe our integral, right, or uh, our DT is supposed to be, sorry, supposed to be sitting right there, right? Flip the arrow head around, <laughs> right? Or maybe, right, the student wants us to think about having the DT sitting right here, right? So um, they haven't told us explicitly, right? What would be the convention if we, were, if we were reading it is we would think about, oh, it should be right there, okay? But it might be with additional work, the student is gonna go ahead and say a little bit more that'll convince us that they have the DT in the, well, the upside down arrow spot where, where it should be. Um, right, so because communication and notation are important here, um, if we see them correctly finding f of 0 equals 1 and f of 10 equals 4, and I, I mean in the context of this missing differential expression, right, I've got the missing differential expression for f of x, I see them come to the correct f of 0 equals 1 and f of 10 equals 4, then the student's going to be allowed to earn one of those first two, the sixth and seventh point, and we'll let them earn the answer point, the eighth point. Um, they're only earning one of the two because they haven't communicated clearly, and that's right. That's one of our, um, I forget, right, one of our big goals in, in AP calculus um, and as mathematicians. So if either of them are incorrect, then um, we, we don't know what's going on, right? Are they, do they have the DT in the wrong spot? Are they moving it around? That's going to be a zero out of three points. Um, so that miscommunication will, will actually carry a pretty heavy consequence for that, that student who's mistakenly left off the difference. All right, let's do our first snippet. Aaron's got the poll up soon. There we go. Oh, this is a this is a three point question, Aaron. Oh, good good catch. All right, so I see the majority of us is, uh, is saying, okay, this student gets no points. So this is actually, they have an integrand in a definite integral. So we've got two to zero of g of t. That's an integrand. It's in a definite integral. They're gonna get that point. They don't have an expression for f of x and they can't get, and the answers are not correct. So this is a one, zero, zero. And this SNP is really getting at that idea that it's a conceptual point. We want them to recognize the need to integrate G to get to F. Um, okay, 20 seconds. All right, this student starts out great. They have an expression, it has the integrand, so that's definitely a one, one. Let me check here. Oh, uh, we see that's the wrong answer. I don't need to know that this is also another mistake, five plus four, it should have been five minus four. When you're reading, we're called readers for a reason. We're just reading, we're not grading. We don't have to figure out why they got it wrong. It's just wrong. So they did not earn that last point. All right, I see the majority uh, th thought, maybe the way I used to think too before I became a reader. This one frustrates me, but it's how it's usually scored. They do get the point for the integrand, but they never wrote an expression for f of x. 
it asks to write an expression of, of f of x and use that expression. So I need to see an expression that has, has an x. So they didn't do that. They did the correct answer. So this is a one, zero, one. And, and part of what's going on is, is the question explicitly said write an expression for f of x. Um, if, if they had to just ask to find f of zero and find f of 10, then, then this might be the kind of thing that would wind up with all three points. But it said f of x, we, we got to find it. All right, this one is real close to being a bald answer, but I do see, obviously they don't get the first two points, but they have the correct answers. They've shown some work where basically, you know, they've added areas. So we're going, they've earned a zero, zero, one. All right, and we only had one question over the seventh point. Um, someone wants to know if the fundamental theorem uh, equation is not solved for f of x, where it asks for the expression, um, can they still earn the seventh point? Um, can, you, can you ask me again? I'm trying yeah. to process the question. Oh, for instance, for instance if, if they don't solve for f of x, can they still earn the point? So we, so we need some version of f of x equals that. So, so if they have like the, the integral from two to x of f prime of t dt equals f of x minus two, for instance. Uh, I didn't follow that, sorry. Yeah, I'm not wrapping my head around this one, Aaron. If, if they haven't solved the expression for f of x. So if they have the integral from two to x of f prime of t dt equals f of x minus two, period would that earn the seventh point? Oh, so here, let me back up a slide to, um, so, so if, if they had, had, for example, taken this, um, this five here. And moved it to the other side. And brought it over to the other side. F of X minus five is equal to, huh. That's a good question, I like it. Uh, Um, I don't, I don't know that I have an instinctual answer at the moment. I see a lot of merit in, in letting them say f of x minus five equals, but uh, do, you, do you have an instinct, Michael, or I don't well, I feel like this might be one of those ones that would get escalated up the chain, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that happens sometimes. New, novel things are seen. You can't decide with your table partner what to do. You ask the table leader, 95% of the time, you're gonna get an answer right there. Every now and then something, the table leader is gonna to go to the question leader. I think, uh, yeah, and I, I don't know if, I've, if I mentioned this beginning, I think about this as like the first briefing that happens during a table, during the pre-reading. And I think a table leader would ask this question and then the, the team would talk about it and work with the exam leaders and the chief readers to have an answer when it went out to all the readers. Um, I, I didn't see, I was, I was looking back at different ways to, that we've created these kinds of integral questions in the past. And I, I don't receive, remember seeing a note about f of x minus five earns the point or doesn't earn the point. Um, so, Sorry, I guess I'm wanting to pun at the moment, which maybe isn't a good answer. I'm sorry whoever asked, I don't. <laughs> and then, and then one, one other question here that just popped yeah. up. If they, if they don't have the initial condition, but use the integrals correctly and everything else right, can they still earn the other points? If they don't have the initial, so they don't have the five. But they have the integrals correct and everything else. And they earn the other points. Well, they wouldn't get the expression for f of x point, mm -hmm. but I would, 
I would say they would got the integrand and if they have the F of zero equals the correct number because they added the five to it, I would, Alex, I would say a one zero one. So, so it's a version of this where like if that five was missing mm -hmm. and they got minus four right here, or is it, is it, yeah, it'd be minus four right here. Is, is that the way to think about this question? So it's, so, so that's, that's gone, right? Yeah. And then are we, so, so I think in this context, it's the integral, right? They've got the integrand point. They have that first point. Yep. They don't have the expression for F of the X. Um, we're only looking for F of zero equals one and um, F of 10 equals four as correct answers. They can't take that integral and say, oh, that's really um, minus four, right? Ah, sorry. <laughs> Right, if they say that integral is equal to minus four, then um, they, they haven't done enough to earn that third point. Yeah, they could, if they brought it, if they did that integral, got an answer, and then added five to that answer and showed that they added the five and got the correct answer, then I would say yes, but still not for the f of x point. Yeah, you're right. So there's a possibility that we see the explicit use of five there. Um, I, I, I think going from that integral of minus four to f of um, zero is equal to one, that we need to see that work. Um, that's kind of like what happened in this, right? If they said, oh, the integral is minus four and then f of zero is equal to one, we, we need to see them using that initial condition to earn that, um, that last point. If you go go back to the slide, uh, oh, yeah, one more. yeah. Now, if they had said, if you had the integral from two to zero of f prime of x dx equals negative four, mm -hmm. even though that's the correct answer, that would be a linkage error because that integral does not equal negative four. So that's why you would have to have seen that they come in and add the five. Um, they have to be careful with the equals. Yeah, so, so these two are equal to each other, right? Right. Yeah. But oh, if but they, if they said, they said that integral is equal to one? This, the integral from two to zero. Oh, is that the negative four? The, yeah, that's negative four. Yeah, so yeah, they, yeah, 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 yeah. They, they could say that equality. Um, yeah, but, okay, I take it back. I has had it backwards. If they had the integral from two to zero of f of x dx equals one, then th that wouldn't be right. Yeah, so you're, you're asking a version of if they had just shown that, right, without the, right, take out the five. Integral from two to 10, f prime is equal to four. That's an, in, uh, that's, that's false. Yeah. Right? It's not equal to four. So, all right. What do you think, Aaron? Are we doing the right answer in this question? Is yeah. there other questions? Yeah, popping I think up we're all demonstrating just, just what goes into, uh, you know, figure out some of these intricacies. Uh, we've got, I've also got Monique here in the in our chat room helping do some moderating as well. She's former question leader for the AP exams. So uh, feel free to continue to ask questions and she will give her her input as well. Thank you, Monique. Yeah. All right, so let's go on to D. Um, so this, this is really the big point part of, of AB1 here. We've got four points for the evaluation of this limit. Um, it, it is one where um, you can see in the, the first two lines of that solution that the, 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 the limit of the numerator is zero, the limit of the denominator is zero. Um, and so this is going to be a place where Lofi tall winds up being relevant. We're going to ask them to demonstrate those limits are equal to zero. Um, we'll be looking for an application of Lofi tall's rule. And then the, the third point there, the limit of as x goes to eight of g prime of x is equal to g prime of eight. You see it explicitly used down inside here. So we're gonna talk about, um, right, why that winds up being important, right? We, right? When we use L'Hopital's rule, we need to know that our hypothesis have all been met. And so we need some kind of properties about the function uh, of the, the numerator and denominator. And so that'll be linked up into, are they paying attention to in particular, right, this, this um, this twice differentiability of the function, right? This is the place where we're actually gonna wind up using that. Um, and then the last piece is, is, piece is gonna be the answer. Um, so there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into this particular question. Um, 
sorry, so well, let's see how we, we parse it out a little bit. Um, right, so the ninth point, you know, we're up to nine out of 15, the limits of the numerator and denominator are zero. So they need to identify both limits as zero. Um, but this expression zero over zero is problematic. Um, and we're, right, we use it informally and colloquially, but it's, it's not the kind of communication that's, that's been accepted. So, um, so how could, this actually, is this the first time I put these question marks in the, out of place? Just, just to mention, right, when you, we're gonna be using these more and more. When you see these here, right, what we're saying is we're not sure how the next four points are gonna get graded. They could go up or down. We'll talk about eligibilities and such. We're just kind of focusing in and saying, here is an answer that would earn the, the, um, the ninth point here. Um, if we see them working separately with the two and, and concluding they're both zero. Um, and, then, and then this is the, right, the, the, the next example on down is this is the case of, well, actually the kind of thing I actually think about is my good scratch work of right, substituting the aid, figuring out the numbers and recognizing zero over zero. And it's, it's this, this place where we're winding up with the zero zero that's not gonna allow them to earn that, um, that point. All right, so the 10th point, L'Hopital rule. So this is independent of the other two points. What we're looking for is a little bit more of, of can they do the, the, the calculus algebraic manipulate, right, the calculus manipulations that are sitting there with L'Hopital's rule. We want to go ahead and see, um, and I put down just as a reminder, right, we're looking for some kind of limit as x goes to 8 of our original limit express, right, the original quotient, where they've taken the derivative of the numerator and they're dividing by the derivative of the denominator, the minus 2x plus e to the x minus 8. Um, but the philosophy, what do we need to see to earn this 10th point? We need a correct limit of quotient of derivatives. So those will be the things, right, the three pieces we'll be looking for. Um, they do have to state the limit as x goes to 8 to earn this 10th point, um, right? You might imagine people would leave off both the limits up there. We, we need to see those limits. Um, the, the, the derivatives of the numerator and the denominator both have to be correct. Um, there's not going to be you get one out of two or you almost had it right to earn this 10th point. We, we need to see both of those derivatives. Um, and we think, right, the derivatives we chose are, are, are not overly complicated. Um, they're, they're within something students should find accessible. Um, let's see, the, they, they can earn this point without restating the given limit. So, so what do I mean by that, right? So we might see a student who just writes this down, right? We, we don't need to see them equating that um, with the, the stated limit in the question. So if they just write that expression down, we're gonna take that as evidence that, that they have applied L'Hopital's rule. Um, and again, right, you can leave off equal signs. Um, that can be missing. You can imagine people put things horizontally or vertically on the page. Um, there's, there's a little bit of, of, of that space, but we wanna see that they, they, they can use L'Hopital's rule in a little more computational fashion, maybe. All right, the 11th point. So this limit of g prime equals g prime of k. So, so again, this will be independent of the previous points or any of the other points. Um, and we're gonna be looking for two things. We wanna see them, right, actually, the way that the, 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 um, the, the scoring guideline mentions, right, equating this limit of g prime with g prime of h. Um, but we also, in addition, right, why is that true? We wanna see them make that connection, stating that g prime is continuous because g is twice differentiable, right? We need to see them using information about the given function g to justify this equality. Um, oh, and as a note, um, we, we, it's, it's not enough to say the limit as s goes to 8 of g prime is equal to zero. Um, that, that does wind up being true, but there's, there's, there's too many steps that would be happening there. We actually need to see that connection explicitly to g prime of 8. Um, oh, and then the last point, Okay, so this one is the one place where we have an eligibility. We, they need to have the 10th point, that L'Hopital's rule point. Um, and what, we're gonna allow one little bit of wiggle room if the student is, is missing the limit. Um, so I wrote down what that expression would look like here, right? If, if they write down, right, our quotient and, and what we we're originally given with our two function is equal to, right, the quotient of the derivatives. So, Right? They, they aren't going to earn L'Hopital's rule points, right? They, they need to um, have the limits to earn that 10th point, okay? But we don't want them to knock them out of the rest of the question. Maybe we'll see some good mathematics uh, after that. 
Um, so so this will be the one case, right, if they, if, if they, they have to have the 10th point, if they're missing the limit, well, okay, we, we won't require the 10th point, right? We've got our exception there, but they can still earn this 12th point. Um, we have to see this correct answer of zero. And if, if they do state a value of the denominator, um, it, it's gotta be correct. It's gotta be minus, minus 15 is why that's there. That's the correct denominator. All right, what do you think, Michael? Anything I, you wanna add in or I should go back to you on any of those four? The only the only thing that's going to come up is well two things. First, the um, the g prime of x equals g prime of eight is and it's because it's continuous because it's twice differentiable. Students are not going to get that right. That's something that as teachers we have to start focusing on. Now the question would be like, why at the beginning didn't they have to say that g of eight like the limit as x approaches eight of g of x is equal to g of eight? We're, gonna, we're saying they already told them that G is continuous in the problem. So since they told them that the graph of G is continuous, they don't have to remind us so they can do that limit. That's the definition of continuity. But when they try to do it with G prime, they weren't told that G prime is continuous. Yes, differenti differentiability implies continuity. They have to tell us that they know that. So that's why they have to say it there. And then the other thing that's gonna come up is people are gonna be angry about the zero over zero. Um, my, my, my story about that is, so when you are a reader, you go to a reading and when you're, I mean, you go to a briefing and in the briefing, you're not allowed to ask questions. It's a room of 200 to 500 people. You cannot ask questions. You just listen to what we're doing here, no questions. You can write them down and then you can talk to your table leader later about it. But then there's still no discussion on how to assign points. That's already been decided. We're just being consistent. So it has been decided that zero over zero is not enough. So we grade it that that is, that is not okay. So they must do it separately. So we must teach them to do it separately. And I, and I guess I would, I would say, right, the, I do think that mentioning twice differentiability to give to give the continuity for G prime of eight is is, is a high bar, um, and it, right, the, the the there will be some student out there who, who will accomplish it, um, and I and I think it's that that place where we ask students: as you write down this equal, how do you know they're really equal? As you write down this next equal, how do you really know it's equal? How do you, right? We want our students to be thinking carefully, and and right, this is the the tipping point here where I'm actually thinking about the limit. Well, how do I know I have that equality? Um, and and wanting to our students to articulate why that's true. All right, so let's go ahead and look at um, the SNPs. So these are the four point polls. There we go, 20, 20 seconds. All right, so if we look, they did the dreaded equals zero over zero, so they're not gonna get the first point. I know it's frustrating, but that's the way that it is scored. Um, they have done L'Hopital's rule, they have the limit, they have the correct derivatives, so they do get that point. They don't have to say by L'Hopital's rule. Uh, they did not mention why they know that G prime of X, the limit of G prime of X goes to eight equals G prime of, of eight. They didn't, so they don't get that point, so that's zero but they do have the correct answer and we're gonna give them that one point. So it's a zero, one, zero. I have the right score here, right? Zero, one, zero, one. Zero, one, zero, one. Yes, thank okay. you. All right. Okay. Mm. All right. Oh, this, this kid did great. They separated them. They showed that the top limit is zero. The bottom limit is zero. That's awesome. They mentioned that 
G is continuous. That's why they were allowed to do that. We, they were already told G is continuous, so that wasn't needed. Uh, oh, look, it looks like they did the derivatives, but all of a sudden I noticed they're missing the limit notation. So they got the first point for the limit numerator and denominator being zero, but they do not get the L'Hopital's point, so that is zero. They don't mention, while they talk about G being continuous, they don't talk about G prime being continuous because of twice differentiability, so they don't get that point. And here's the one exception we're making. They can earn the answer point even though they left off the limit for L'Hopital's rule. Normally they can't earn that point if they don't do L'Hopital's rule, so they do get the answer point. So that's a one, zero, zero, one. All right, on this one, both G is continuous and G prime is continuous because G is twice differentiable. They, got, they took care of that right off the bat, so they're good to go. They're, they're definitely gonna get that third point. Uh, they do the limit, uh, the numerator and denominator separately. That's awesome. They do L'Hopital's rule. So far, I've got a one, one, one. I glance down. They don't have to simplify, but they never subbed in. They never changed G prime of eight to be zero that's you can't stop there you have to evaluate the function so they're going to get a one 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 zero last one Okay, obviously they do not get the, they have not earned the first point. They did not show us that the numerator and denominator go to zero. They have correctly applied L'Hopital's rule. So we're gonna give them that, they earn that point one. They have not mentioned the G prime limit. That's gonna be a zero, but the answer is correct. So this is a one, a zero, one, zero, one. All right. Um, lots of questions, obviously, about the zero over zero. Always. Um, I, I think, though, can you, can you clarify that if a student were to write something about in words, this yields the indeterminate form of zero over zero, which would lead to L'Hopital's rule, that would be acceptable, correct? I, I think so. I mean, the... Uh, if, they show, the if they show independently the, the numerator and denominator equals zero, and then they write in words, that this would give the indeterminate form zero over zero, therefore we can apply L'Hopital's rule. That would be acceptable. Yes, and what we're doing is we're being very careful with what equals means, right? That we really need to have two quantities that are identical to each other. And zero, zero over zero being an indeterminate form, you can think of it as taking on all possible real values. That limit actually really is equal to just zero. It's, it has a precise numeric value. Um, so that, Th those two things are not actually right. So the, the issue is that, that these two things are not actually equal to each other because this one over here is, is actually has a value of um, the, the real number zero. It's not indeterminate. Okay. So I, I think there's, there's still be some debate there, obviously. I, I, I know that yes. But well, there are always, yes, there will be debate. And if in your class, do you let them say equals zero, zero? Do you write it yourself? I do. But <laughs> But so, but this is how they grade it at the reading. And then so, so arrows, what do arrows count? What, how do arrows count for you all? Um, we, we talked about this uh, last week, right? Yes, <laughs> I think uh, we had some divergent memories about whether arrows were okay or not. Um, I remember them being okay and then not being okay, so. I, I think I think what right what what's the issue with the arrows and the equals and the zero over zeros is, is we want to make sure people are saying correct mathematics is the way I think about it, and and places where we wind up with statements that are incorrect can be uh, right be problematic. Um,
Um, is, is there a version where a student draws a, a arrow, the numerator goes up to a zero and the arrow of the denominator arrow to a zero, but they never create that fractional expression. Um, I, I guess the thing I would want to, right, I'm, I'm, I'm not a high school teacher, so, but I, I do teach calculus. Um, I think right knowing that my work is gonna go to this setting where this is a sensitive issue um, and, and a thing where a really careful line has been drawn, I'd encourage students to stay away from arrows and, and zero over zeros. And um, this, this, yeah, this is a place that I would encourage them not to use that symbolism. And, and, and I, th I think best practice would be train them in the way the scoring guidelines are written because those have been pretty consistent. So that, that's how you should teach you. That's, I think, the best practice for how students should communicate their work for this part. I did see someone wrote, do they have to write L'Hopital's rule? No. That it, the point for L'Hopital's rule is not saying. You're muted, Michael. Sorry, as long you don't have to say L'Hopital's rule, as long as you have the correct hypothesis and conclusion, you get that L'Hopital's rule point. So no, you don't have to write it. The scoring rubric is just like a perfect one. Right, um, two more quick questions. What if the middle two- Can you, actually, one, one more thing about that, the scoring guideline, I, I think we landed on, it says applies L'Hopital's rule. Um, and so that, that's a place or uses L'Hopital's rule where we're looking for evidence that it happened. Um, and writing the word L'Hopital's rule is pretty clear, right, if they do it correctly, that they're using that. Partly what this, uh, um, right, what we're briefing you on is other ways to read into the student's work that they really are using it. So. Uh, two more quick questions. What if, what if the middle two expressions were missing in the L'Hopital's rule um, equation you had in your scoring guideline? So let me go back to the scoring guideline. Right there, the ones you had circled. On your on your slide there, if those two exp expressions were not there, how would that be scored? So the the requirement was that um, to earn this. But this is about the fourth point. Is oh oh. So they're saying that's the, all the work. Maybe nothing else is here, but just this is equal to zero over negative fifteen equals zero. Yeah. Um, so I guess I would walk through, I don't see the limits of the numerator and denominator is zero, right? If, if all we see is that, that last line with that missing piece, no, no limits of numerator and denominator is zero, so they do not earn the first point. I don't see an application of L'Hopital's rule, right? That's, that's really what this, right? This is one way to, in the scoring guideline where we've shown the application of L'Hopital's rule. So if that's missing, they don't have the second point. Um, I'm not seeing this limit anywhere because we were, we were asking this explicit connection between G prime and zero. Um, well, it's really G prime to G prime of eight. Actually, that was the explicit connection. Um, and going from G to zero, there's too many stats, right? The student has to communicate their work. Um, and then the last point, the answer point. So the requirement was that they earned this point, right? In order to, to be eligible for the last one, they have to earn that one. And they haven't, right? Because they, they were missing that L'Hopital school. So that student's not eligible to earn the last point. So I, I think, have I landed on all zeros? Does that sound right? If uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the only exception to that is if the, they do L'Hopital's rule and they leave off the limit, they mm -hmm. can get the answer point. That's the only, otherwise they have to have the applies L'Hopital rule point to get the answer point. Yes, yeah, so if you just see what's in that box without right, the circled things there on inside the box, then it's, a, it's a all, all four points or, or zero. Yeah. Uh, and, th and then really quickly, if you can answer, is it possible for a student to use left and right hand limits to find the value instead of using L'Hopital's rule? Um, I don't have a quick answer. I have to sit down and think about okay. it. I, we, we, will, we will get back to that one. That is a great table leader kind of question. <laughs> so thanks for asking it. <laughs> so, all right. Another, actually, it's kind of interesting. Another perhaps convention we might think of as problematic with AP reading is the three decimal point convention, right? Why does everything have to be at three decimal points? Why should it cost you, right, not earn points because of three decimals? So, right, a choice has been made, and so we conform how we present answers to that boundary of the test. That might be another way to think about the zero over zero thing. 
All right, so the last part, let's see, the last part, we've um, given them a new function, right? We've been playing with Fs and Gs. Let's switch to H, and we've given them, actually, it's, it's uh, right, G of X plus 3X all squared and asked them to find the slope of the tangent line. Um, and so we're looking for some expression for H prime of X and then the answer, which in this case is 63. Um, so, so let's talk about how we do partial credit for this. Um, so we're expecting to see a chain rule or a product rule. There might be a student who takes that square and splits it up into two pieces. We'll let them present um, their answers at right, the H prime of X in terms of X, or some students will immediately start substituting four right away because I, right, they've recognized I need to be working at X equals four. We didn't ask for an expression for H prime of X, um, right, that's a, a landmark for us in trying to think about awarding partial credit. So, right, that's different than before we said, what's the expression for f of x? We haven't done that here. Um, so, so we'll go ahead and allow them to substitute four inside there. And we're going to think about, in terms of this derivative, single errors can earn one point. So, so this is a place where we've got a whole bunch of different examples to kind of walk through and draw those, those boundaries. Um, so, so here's a chain rule solution. It's right, that's the one that we presented on the scoring guideline. Um, so, so this is, right, we're looking to see h prime of x is the correct chain rule, or if we're allowing substitutions of four, right, you can see four plugged everywhere. Even, right, this, this 12 is equal to three times four, what, we're going to let a student do that little bit of arithmetic in their head in the context of so much other evidence that they really have a correct derivative. Um, let's see. So, so these next three, we're going to think of as, or I shouldn't say all three, the first couple as places of, right, single errors can earn one point. So what's the single error in this first chain rule is that we're missing, what's missing? The leading two, right? We'd expect to see a leading two out there and that's missing. But otherwise, we see a perfect chain rule. So we're going to let that start student earn one out of the two points. Um, Let's see, what's the single error in the next one? They've left off the plus three. Okay, so if they're missing the plus three, everything else is perfect. They got the leading two, they brought that down in front. They, we're gonna um, allow that single error to allow them to earn one out of the two points, the, the 13 to 14 points. If we see two errors though, right, this is a combination of the preceding ones. The leading two is missing. We don't see a plus three. This is simply too many errors. We don't know what rule they're using. They're not using the correct, they're not using the chain rule. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, oh, in other cases, so these are, again, indications that they aren't using the chain rule. If we just see them differentiate the inside and leave it as a square, or if we just see the, bring the two down in front and we never see it through the inside, they're not using the chain rule. Those are, it, it's a zero out of two. Um, and we'll talk about in a minute how these would have earned the, the last point or, or not. But before we do that, let's talk about the product rule version of all these things. So there really are, you want to think about chain rule and product rules being very, created very parallel to each other. So if we see the perfect product rule, right, so this is partly why we have calculus teachers grade these, is right, reading them, there's, right, you can imagine, right, there's all kinds of commutativity going on here. These kinds of things can show up in lots of different orders. Um, but, and even, right, I, I've drawn that on that B, right, three times four, and then it turns into 12 later. I wouldn't be surprised to see that kind of thing. We'll let students do that, and, and those would be perfect product rules. Um, let's see, so these are the single error product rule errors. Um, so let's see, let's go hunting for our errors that showed up in these, right? We got my first, we're the second, plus, oh, there we go, right? They've got a three X here. So if that three X shows up in that one spot when it should have been a three, we'll think of that as a single error. Now you can imagine reading that is, is hard, right? We've been through like parts A through D trying to read carefully, getting down to this one where we might have to read that sentence. And, and that's the thing we talk a lot about at the reading is, right, this student, we have to be very careful going through that work um, and looking for all those different pieces. Um, this was another one of those single errors. So the student went ahead and left off. Um, what are they missing? The plus three there. Um, oh yeah, but oh look, here they've also left off the plus three, right? So they've, they've got a kind of consistent single error. So in that context, right, we, we are going to actually think about this as one error. They've told us that they believe the derivative of g plus 3x is g prime. If they use it consistently in both parts, that will, we'll think about that as a single error. But we're not going to do this kind of mixing and matching where, oh, look, there's the 3x error. Oh, here's the g prime error. Right? There's too many errors happening there. Um, so, so that's not a single error, that's multiple errors. 
Um, and again, false product rules. You might see students, right? What do you do when you do a product, right? You just differentiate the first and differentiate the second and multiply them together. That's not the product rule. Um, and I don't, I don't even know how I came up with this last one. So that's just, it's a, uh, it's, I don't know, it's not a rule. So it's incorrect. All right, so chain rule or product rule can substitute, right? Work with X or substitute the four will allow single errors and a little bit of consistent single errors to, to earn one point. 15 point, you have to have at least one of the two preceding ones. Um, if, if, and so we're gonna split this into the derivative is correct and a single point error in the derivative. So if the derivative is correct, you can earn it with having 63, you can have unsimplified expressions. We're also gonna allow m equals 63. And so this is a, a case of, of being a little bit more generous in terms of reading, letting students use some notation there. We, we've asked them for a slope. That's a, a common symbol for slope. That's the one I learned first, was m equals 63. We're also gonna go ahead and let the students um, earn this 15 point. If we see 63 in the kind of standard point and place in, in, in point slope form um, of, of, a, of a line. If we see them, and we're actually working at four, 110.25 is the actual, um, uh, the, the y coordinate that goes with four. It's the h of four. Um, so if we see a perfectly correct point slope form of the line with a 63 in the slope place, well, a student might just present that, they might box it, We'll, we'll allow the student to earn the point there. Um, let's see. Oh, for one point derivatives, read with consistent answers. So this would, this would be an example of a, of a one point error. This is the one, right, they're missing the plus three on the end. So in this case, right, what it, we're gonna have to, as readers, go through and plug in the values of g of four and g prime of four, um, which, right, we've gotten off of the graph. Um, right, g prime of four is, we've been told that g has a horizontal tangent line. So it turns out that in this case, that single error is going to make the zero. Or we might see the expanded out version times zero or m equals zero. So this reads really parallel, um, right? That zero in terms of the point, so form of the line. I, and I, I'm willing to allow, right? You see a product zero times this thing, that's zero. And we're not going to require the x equals or x minus four in that spot. Um, that's everything I had for that one. Is there, is there something else you'd add in, Michael? Are we good to go, Snens? Oh, we lost you there. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, good to go, Snips. Okay. All right, so here we go. Um, oops. I can press arrow, go over. <laughs> All right, snip one. All right, first poll, and there it comes. All right, so this one, there is no evidence for a chain rule or a product rule. So they're gonna be not able to earn any of the points. So this is zero out of two, zero. All right, they did everything correctly, but then they ended with this equation of a tangent line that wasn't asked for. They do that all the time. We're saying as long as it's correct, we're gonna read 63 as a slope and accept it. So we're gonna give this a two one. Okay, next one. Yeah, you know, actually, it's a sudden looking at that. <laughs> Um, I talked about this as the, the correct point, right? We don't, we don't actually have uh, H of four here, right? Oh, is that one backwards? Yeah, that should be the um, no, 110.25. <laughs> 
um, instead of 1.5. They just read off G of four instead of, of uh, H of four. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, sorry, friends. So that, that's, uh, that, that we, we should actually back that up to a zero, right? Because it's not the slope of the tangent line, or it's not the tangent line. Correct. Yes. Yeah. They look back at the graph of G, not when H of four. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Recreating the briefing for you. <laughs> okay. Last, last one. No, nope. Second to last. All right, this looks like one of the an example of one mistake. So we're gonna get one out of two. And then we said we'll be consistent with the answer. It would be correct based on their wrong. So they will give them the answer point. Yeah, and that one error is the, the missing two out front there. Now last one. Do you have the poll, Aaron? Or uh, I'm not seeing it. Yeah, it's going. Okay. All right, we'll stop it. Oh, now I see it. Thank you. So this one, everything's great. They're perfect. This is the student that said they wanted to simplify, and they simplified wrong, causing them to not earn the answer point. It's two zero. Okay, Aaron. Any so, questions or? We have, I did not write any down, so I, I think we're okay here. Um, we we have one more one more slide. Just uh, I, I'm not sure if this will show up in any of the answer in this question, but but just in case it does, there's this this issue about decimal presentations, right? The final answers have to be accurate to three digits after the decimal point, rounded or truncated, and and then how, how does that get handled at the reading? Um, we don't want to be taken off. A Point every time, or students not allow students to earn point every time they make this single mistake. But but right, they they are required to follow this rule, and so right the the way that plays out is they don't earn that first available point. Um, but then there's this idea of immunity that gets used that they can earn all subsequent points with correct or consistent answers, rounded or truncated to one or two decimal digits. So there's a there's a max one point not earned, and I'd say that's on each um, individual question. So AB one here, there might be a place that would happen. When we go to AB two, it's a reboot, and they they have that same risk. So the times I've talked to students about AP grading, I was like, please don't make this mistake. But I think it's one of the more frustrating ones for readers because there's all this great calculus going on, and we don't want this to to cost too many points. So, all right. Um Sorry, in the last two uh, snips, there were missing parentheses. Does that matter? Where were there? As long as it doesn't affect the order of operations. Okay. Now, yeah, it, that, that's another nuanced thing with the parentheses. If it affects the order of operations and you don't simplify, that can obviously be wrong. If you miss one and then you have the right answer and simplified correctly, usually, We'll let that go. It, yeah, right it, it really, it, it's the, it depends on the question. It, it's real nuanced. Yeah, and does the same thing show up here? Yeah, they've got the right parentheses. It's missing here, right? Mm -hmm. Ah, shit. It's, it, it, should, it disappears here for a, yeah, a single and then, line. Yeah, and back. And then there's recovery, yeah. If it had not, if it had not come back. Yeah, yeah. so in this one, I, I feel, well, and they wanted to make a mistake later. That first line here um, definitely locks in the first two points, right? They've earned them. Um, the one before that, actually, I wound up, I, to be honest, I missed that missing parentheses. Yeah. I didn't read that carefully enough. Um, 
I'm kind of really torn. I don't. <laughs> um, it seems generous because it does come back. It does reappear. Uh, do we count it as two mistakes? Yeah, I don't. I, I won't yeah, have a. That would be a discussion there. because because yeah. it came back because it came back. Does it can't that we say okay that was only one mistake yeah but it, but it is a, it is a communication issue right where they they haven't explicitly given us and these conversations to... happen with your table leader this is how how it goes yeah well and I, I would say what would happen is is we would uh, then the, in a in a big reading with all the table leaders with all or not with all the readers the five hundred people there would be a discussion of missing parentheses I I didn't. Uh, I didn't catch that or watch for that and thinking about pulling this together, but there would be a slide at it to say, all right, what do we do with this, right? We need a definitive decision because those missing parentheses are just going to happen and we need to have uh, a uniform solution. So um, I could, I, this one, I, I could see staying as the, as the, I don't know if I can write it. Yeah, yeah, I can fit in there. I could also see another possibility is this is a zero to zero. Um, and that would be the, the tough debate. Right, which one of those two does it land on? That's a big swing. It's a two point swing. Um, and, there, and there might even be a, a version of, yeah, they didn't tell us the right derivative, but we've seen them recover and we'll allow that to be a case where they could be eligible for that answer point. Um, I think those would be the three possible creating things there. And, um, I'm not going to have a good answer in 30 seconds here. <laughs> so, sorry. All right. So that wraps up question one. Um, we're going to take about three to four minutes for you to uh, compose yourself before we jump into question two. I know, I know that was a lot to take in. Um, let me just give you some uh, frames of reference here. We have student samples at the bit.ly uh, mock exam 2020 link. So you can go there. There are three student samples from actual student work that's been submitted. Um, I would encourage you when you have time to look over those and see how you would score those. We will post the scores that we think those student samples earned after the session today. So in the interest of time, we will let you do that on your own. Um, but again, take, we're going to take about three minutes here. Get yourself a glass of water, run, take a break. Uh, we will pick up with question two in approximately three, uh, two minutes now, right at 2.30. 2.30. So, All right. Good. Sounds great. All right. Yep. You got hot coffee on your screen? All right, we are, we are ready to go here. We're going to jump right into to AB2. Okay. Um, yeah, so what happens on AB2? We've got hot coffee coming through a coffee maker, filling up, and um, we're, we've been told there's this differentiable function C, um, the time's measured in minutes, and we've got select values that are handed to us on this table for, for this function. Um, and then we ask questions about it. We want them to approximate C prime of 4.5, showing their work, and then explain the meaning of C prime of 4.5 in the context of the question. Um, we're asking them to find whether or not, determine whether or not there's a time where C prime of T is equal to 1.25 and justify that answer, right? Uh, right? Calculus teachers were thinking mean value theorem is gonna be our friend here. Um, and hopefully our calculus students are too. Um, and then we switch to uh, right, asking for a left Riemann sum, three intervals of equal length indicated by the data to approximate this integral. Um, and then the last point is we switch to a model. And using the model, we want to talk about why the cup, uh, the amount of coffee in the cup is, is increasing over that time interval. So, so just like we did before, we're going to walk through the four parts. This one we landed on having 10 points, um, not the usual nine, even though it's, it's pretty close to a, a standard question, just with, to keep the ratios of, of points equal across the, the two, or appropriate, I should say, across the two questions. Um, so, all right, so let's talk about this, this first part A, we're gonna approximate C prime of 4.5. So there's two points that we, we put in this section, an approximation point, and then they're asked to explain the meeting, so an interpretation. So we'll be looking for them to be, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. So I think I've got this on the next slide. Um, you can see we'll be working on the interval from six to three um, and finding the 0.933 ounces per minute. And then we'll be looking for them to talk about the amount of coffee is increasing. Um, 
at a rate of 0.93 ounces per minute at t equals 4.5 minutes. So, yeah, so for the approximation, right, we'll be looking for 0.933. This is where that three decimal rule will be relevant. There's other ways the students might say 2.8 over three, they might say 14 over 15 um, with, with some supporting work that, that will come along because we asked them to show work. They have to provide a difference quotient with values from the table. So we need to see where that number came from. They can't just say um, 0.933. And then we're only going to work with approximations from 3 to 6, t equals 3 to t equals 6, because they've been asked to work at 4.5, right? and those are those closest values, input values on the table. Um, so I wanted to show you things that might earn this first point. And again, right, the, the one is they've got it. The question mark is, well, we'll see what happens in the interpretation. Um, here are some things, I'll look at some ambiguous versions and then things that will not earn the point. So we might be looking for, um, right, so this is the C of six minus C of three over six minus three. If they can just present that fraction, um, we'll, we'll let them, right, we've, we've told them to look at C prime. We're gonna look at those things coming from the table. We'll, we'll even let them simplify the, the, the three in the denominator, six minus three is, is not, it's, it's arithmetic we can do in our head pretty easily. Um, hopefully correctly, but we can do easily. Um, and this, right, some students might introduce this f as their function. At, at this point, right, if we're, if we're only looking at, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, this might be something that's more formulaic, um, where we really need to see that right, work in context, right, the whole values from the table piece, this is a place where that's relevant, having the rest of that fraction, I need to see some work with it. Um, all right, so what's in the middle column there? Um, so, so if we see the C of six minus C of three over six minus three. Um, so I've got the double question marks there because we, we need to keep looking. It might be that they'll, they'll give some information in their interpretation that will, will give us the fact that they're thinking about those values from the table. Similarly, if they only work with the numerator, right? We might look down and see it divided by three in an interpretation. So these at the moment are ambiguous. Um, you have to finish reading and see this. They're still eligible for their first point, but they haven't quite gotten far enough communicating their work. Um, things that will not earn it. So, so there's, there's a couple small errors that show up in here, right? We've got this 12.2 instead of what we, we should really have is a 12.4. Um, so if, if we have that kind of arithmetic error, so we'll, so we'll have to watch for those. Um, and then this is a person that's not working on that interval from from three to six, they're working from six to two. Um, that gives an approximation, but it's not right. It's, it's not the, the best approximation that, that they can find with the information that's available to them. Okay. Um, so the interpretation point. So this is independent of the first point. We'll let right, students can earn the second point without the first. So we'll need to see three elements. Um, we'll see need to see some statement that the amount is increasing. And I've got or consistent. It's possible that we'll see some kind of arithmetic mistake where they get a negative for C prime, in which case we want to see decreasing. Um, so right, we'll look for, but most, most of the time we'll, we'll expect to see increasing. Uh, we'll need to see units, ounces per minute, um, maybe with the approximation, right? So if it shows up when they did their computation, they don't have to restate the units. And we'll let them use abbreviations like OZ, uh, per min, th things like that. Um, and then we'll need some reference to the time, the t equals 4.5 minutes. Um, t equals 4.5, 4.5 minutes, right? It doesn't have to be all of that, but, but they need to make that connection too. So, oh yeah, so here's a list of things that would earn the second point. So references to the amount of coffee or the coffee, we see increasing um, the 9.933 ounces per minute at 4.5, right? They've attached those units to the 4.5. Um, we might see an unsimplified expression, right? They don't have to say the amount of coffee, we'll accept coffee. Um, in a minute, we'll talk about other things that might show up, attached to coffee rates, velocities, things like that, that, that won't work, but, but coffee is, is something we will accept. Um, increasing maybe an unsimplified expression. Here's that abbreviation we talked about. Um, we'll allow t equals 4.5 up in the table. Next to t, it's got the units of minute. So, so for just that, um, so, so, so not a, uh, not attached to the rate, but attached to just a single quantity in that table will allow them to reference it without the minutes. Um, let's see, oh, here's that, that consistent thing, right? We've got decreasing at negative 0.9 ounces per minute, right? If we had a negative, we'd expect to see decreasing. Um, 
right? When 4.5 4 minutes have passed, right? We're gonna interpret that as referencing something more instantaneous. Um, and then, oh yeah, so for this last one, right? We're missing the number there. So, so right, this is that bit where it's independent at the first point and will allow the students to, to still be able to, to earn that second point. There's a couple of things that won't work. Um, rate of coffee, um, right? We need to see amounts for just plain coffees. Um, this, right, interpreting that positive number is giving us decreasing. Um, the, the third one, it looks really good. It's increasing 0.93 ounces per minute, but then there's, there's a reference, instead of a, an instantaneous reference, we actually see a, a suggestion of an, of an average rate of change sitting here with this, this during. So since it's more average, well, they're referencing average rate of change rather than instantaneous, they will not be allowed to earn that second point. Um, and then let's see what's going on. Oh, oh, this is another rate of coffee changing. So, so these are things that, that would not allow the student to earn that second point. They've misinterpreted the meaning of C prime of 4.5. Okay, it's next time. All right, first snip. All right, so this one, they have that C of six minus C of three over six minus three. That's the maybe. And then we see that they do say it's equal to 0.933 ounces per minute. Um, they have amount of coffee is increasing at a rate of 9.33 ounces per minute and the time. So this is a one one. Okay, this student has, they have a difference quotient, that's correct. They have the units, we go to the explanation, everything's good, but they forgot to talk about the time. So this student's gonna earn a one zero. Okay, here's this correct difference quotient that causes us to have the maybe. So we'll look at the, the reasoning and we do see the correct number. So those combined get us the first point and they have correctly explained, including that it's the rate, the number and the time. So this is a one, one. And last one. All right, here's the frust this frustrates me. There's no difference quotient. Therefore, they're not eligible for the first point. So that's zero. And then you see this often, the velocity of the coffee. They, they think the first derivative is always velocity and the second is acceleration. That is not true or is not the velocity of the coffee. So they do not earn that it's zero, zero. All right, uh, two questions. If a student forgot to put units, how does that affect their points? Units are all on the second point, right, as part of the interpretation. So if everything, if everything else was correct, but they forgot to put units or put wrong units. Right. And the units either need to be at the an with the answer that they gave or in the explanation, but somewhere. And that's, yes, second point. 
All right. Did, did anybody, um, yeah, like, like, well, this might be, right, the student had ounces per minute up with that fraction. They didn't need to re-mention ounces per minute here. They, they still missed it because of the 4.5 minutes, or the T equals 4.5, but, but this would be a place where they could emit ounces per minute in their interpretation. Okay. Since it's already uh, up with the answer. The other question that came up was, does a student have to specifically say the word increasing or could they just say something about how fast it's changing? That's that rate of change I talked about earlier. Yeah. Okay. Like yeah, so I think we're, we're, we're looking for increasing. We're looking for some kind of interpretation that a, a positive rate corresponds to increasing. Okay. I think that's one of those we talked about. It used to be good enough, but now to be safe, it's not quite. All right. Yeah, there's, I think there was a concern that a rate of change, anytime you see C prime or F prime, is formulaic, right? Are the students really expressing enough understanding? So. All right, then that, that does it for that one. Okay, AB2B. All right, so we've got our, uh, our mean value theorem question here. We're going to be looking for them to uh, make this connection between differentiable and continuous, that if the C is differentiable, it gives us that C is continuous. We need some explicit connection there, um, or at least the statement that C is continuous. Um, we'll be looking for a ratio on that, right, the C of six minus C of two over six minus two, that they're, they're looking for, well, an average rate <laughs> that you need as part of the mean value theorem. And then this conclusion using the mean value theorem. So, so let's talk about how those points can get earned. I think there's a lot of clarification that needs to come with, with a couple of these points. So um, we will let the student just say the function's continuous. They've already been told it's differentiable. We're not going to require them to restate C as differentiable. Um, and it can appear anywhere in part B, um, but, but we're going to be looking in part B. We're not going to go fishing around the whole question looking for some recognition of continuity. Um, we need to see it within that part where it's this part B where it's relevant. Um, they can use any of C of T, C of X, or just plain C. Um, we're going to allow students to earn this without referring to the interval, um, with or without interval reference. That's a choice we've made in, in this particular context. Um, there, and we're also going to accept open or closed interval notation. I, I don't know if you've ever seen the kind of, we're trying to discern between a parenthesis and a bracket um, can be really hard and, and people I love can come up with very divergent interpretations. So um, for the sake of consistency, um, we're, we're going to not, if they, if they use intervals, we're not going to distinguish between open or close. Um, and there's really practical reasons to drive that. Um, let's see, so the po fourth point, um, we're, we're, we're looking for a, a difference quotient. It could be symbolic or numeric. Um, it's got to be presented in the context. So we can't just see some, right, f of a minus f of b. We need to actually see them working with our c see them working with the two and the six. And, and it's possible that they, they might be, um, right, because we, we've given them input values at two and three and six. There might be a couple different distance difference quotients, three or two, right, three different quotients. So as, as long as it's, they're, they're working in the right realm of looking at difference quotients, and include the one we're looking at, right, the one that's relevant, but, but we're not going to expect them to instantly recognize the right one. They're allowed to do some scratch work. See. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is that whole bit. Well, we're not sure what they've done for the first point. What would earn the second or the actually we're not sure what they've done for the third point. What would earn the fourth point? And we're not commenting on the fifth point just yet. So, so we might see the expression, right, the one that's given on the scoring guideline, the C of 6 minus C of 2 over 6 minus 2. We might see it with pulled values from the table. Um, and again, we'll let them simplify 6 minus 2 to 4. Um, this is another one of those cases, right, if they're working with F to start with, they actually have to convince us that they're actually in our context, right? We need to see these connections to the values in the table or converting to Cs, some, something like that. Um, let's see. So what are things that will not earn? So these are those cases, right, the Fs, right, where I'm not sure where they came from, right? right? It's, it's just too much like a, right? it's not embedded in our question. The function is C, the function's not F. Um, this one is really tantalizingly close, right? I mean, they've actually done the work to, right, or, right, we might read in that they've done the work to pull the values from the table and simplify it. Um, and that's, that's just not enough. Um, 
we, we actually want to see them explicitly tell us, right? Show your work, say a little bit more about where this came from. Um, and likewise, right, simplifying 15.2 minus 10.2 to 5, they, they've gone too far. They, it's their responsibility to communicate the, the work that they've done. And so these are not going to be enough to earn that um, fourth point. Okay, and the fifth point, conclusion using the mean value theorem. We're going to ask them to have earned one of the two preceding points. They have to be, right, both of those are about the hypotheses, connected to the hypotheses of the mean value theorem. We're going to ask them to have learned at least one of those two. Um, they have to state yes, or at least one, or there is, or write something to, to give the answer, <laughs> to, to confirm the answer. And they either need to name the mean value theorem or write that whole, they can state hypotheses and conclusions. They can do this in general, or they can do it in the context. Um, and again, we're, we're going to allow them to um, not reference the interval here um, to, to earn this point. Okay, snip time. Yeah. Per snip. So these are three pointers, right? Correct. All right. This student says the function C is differentiable and continuous. They have the difference quotient, correct points equals 1.25. There's the hypothesis has been fulfilled. The conclusion then, there is a T between two and six, such that C prime of T equals 1.25. That's the correct conclusion. You don't have to label, you don't have to name the theorem if you say the correct hypothesis and conclusion. So this is a one, one, one. And this is that contextual statement of hypotheses and conclusions. All right, this is an example of just because this is the way it's read the reading, you don't have to do that in your class. This is sort of the minimum that we would take. So they've got differentiability and continuity, the correct difference quotient. And then they say, so there is. They are answering the question, which was the conclusion. They're going to get it. Do you like giving it to them? Probably not. And that is right at the edge of what, what they take. Well, one thing it might be helpful to point out is in this question, it's, it says determine whether or not there is a time <laughs> where the conclusion of the mean value theorem is. And that student has said there is. And so, so partly after we'd written this question and thought about it some more, we're like, okay, the student wrote this up. We, they have answered there is. And there's this implicit insertion of the rest of the question. So, all right. Yeah, all right, here the student said that the function C is differentiable. They go on. So they say by mean value theorem, correct conclusion. The problem is it needs to be differentiable and continuous. We're going to argue differentiability implies continuity. Yes, I know that. It's now expected the students say they know that. And that, that is not, that is a, I'm for sure it's brought up at the reading. They have to say differentiable and continuous. And I do want to point out, so for that one, they wouldn't get the first point. It'd be a zero, one, one. I want to do, I want to point out that many times this, this question is only worth two points. It's the correct ratio and then the conclusion with the mean value theorem. And when they don't have the differentiability and continuity, they lose that second point. 
since we're having to have a little bit more points, we are giving a little leeway and letting them earn the last point. But normally they wouldn't. It would only be worth two points. And if they don't say differential and continuous, they're not going to get that last point. So this one is for us today is a zero one one. All right, here's the student that has the correct hypothesis and conclusion and decided to name the theorem and they called it Rolle's theorem. This is not Rolle's theorem, it's mean value theorem. So they're not gonna earn the last point, it's a one, one, zero. All right, and we had no questions uh, that you have not. Oh, actually, bonus. all right, sorry. We, we have one more snap that we just wanted to highlight. Yeah. Bonus, sorry. all right, there we go. That's okay. Secret. We wanted to include this one because you will see it. You can't just throw a theorem on. There has to be supporting work. This is a zero, zero, zero. And, and this is the case for the eligibility for this is we either need to see the connection, the continuity, right? The, uh, I think it was the first point in this section or we need to see the, the difference question. There's gotta be some work, right? They have to earn one of these two points to earn the, the last one. Okay, uh, part C. So we're going to go to Riemann sum. They've asked to do a left Riemann sum with three subintervals of equal length um, to approximate this integral. So the, the first two points will be for the Riemann sum, and then the, the last point will be for the approximation. So, so what are we looking for in the Riemann sum? So we'll be looking for a sum of three products. We'll be looking for a base times a height. So we need to see a sum of products. We want those bases to have equal width. And we want the heights to be from the left-hand endpoints. Um, for sum of products, we will accept an implicit sum. You might imagine, right, sometimes students stack their numbers vertically. Um, we'll allow a leading zero, um, right, the, the, that left-hand endpoint is zero, like all the way over on the left. And so we won't necessarily require a product. We prefer it, right, but um, so there's, there's a little bit of sum of products. There's some space in there to be um, a little more generous with student grading. Uh, the equal width bases, we'll expect a width three, and the heights have to be from the left-hand endpoints. We'll accept symbolic or numeric um, there. So, sorry, so how do we split this up? That was for both points. For the, the sixth point for the Riemann sum, if you have two of those three components present, we'll, we'll, they'll earn the sixth point. And if you pull it all together, have a complete correct presentation, that'll be the seventh. So, all right, so yes, remember, here's our three criteria, six points, two of three, seventh point correct. And so just again, some examples to talk through, right? We might see the, right, this is the, the correct numeric version, three times the left-hand endpoint, three times the 12.4 plus three times the 15.2. We do see a sum of products equal with bases and heights from the left-hand endpoints. We'll talk about this, this one will happen to earn that third point. We'll talk about that, or the eighth point, I should say, we'll talk about that in a minute. We'll, we'll allow them also to factor out the three, right? So it could be C of zero, C of three, C of six times three. So that, that, that width component could be base width component could be pulled out. Um, so let's see. So I mentioned the leading zero, right? Three times zero is zero. We'll, we'll allow the students to, to mention that, but they actually do need to address it, right? We'll, we'll expect them to have that zero sitting there. Some indication that they're, that they're thinking about the whole interval that they're working on, um, right? How do I know they haven't shifted to just the, the, the three to, or, or that, right, the, what, what numbers do we add again? <laughs> so they're, they're not just looking at the, the last two pieces. We need a three part um, Riemann sum. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, so this has to do with that issue of, of if they multiplied out, three times 12.4 is 37.2. We really are requiring a sum of products, okay? We need to be able to see 
this information. Um, it's not enough for us to know that 37.2 is three times 12.4. They have to communicate where they came up with those numbers from. So that, that's not sufficient. Um, and then some other kinds of things we might to see, expect to see, uh, they decided to ignore the, the equal width basis part. Maybe they just, every single interval, they're gonna put a box on it for their Riemann sum. Um, they might choose to use different right interval widths, two, four, and three, instead of equal width intervals. Um, and then this last one would be the case if they went with a, with a right Riemann sum. So, so all of those wind up being right. We can see they're, they're somewhat in the ballpark. They're, they are thinking about Riemann sums, but it's not perfectly correct. So they've gotten the two out of three, but they, they haven't got the, uh, the completely correct presentation. So those would be one out of twos. Um, and then, all right, well, then let's talk about the eighth point, the approximation. You have to have earned both of the sixth and seventh points. So we're expecting to see a perfect Riemann sum, complete Riemann sum, um, in order to be eligible for the approximation point. Um, and the only numeric values that we'll accept have to be equal to that correct approximation of 82.8. So the unsimplified sum of products is, is a perfect expression. This one we're kind of waiting around on, right? What are they gonna do with C of zero, C of three, and C of six? Will they pull the right values from the table? So we need to read the rest of their work before making a decision. If that's all that's on the page, that's a two zero. But if they pull out this values from the table, it can be a little bit more. Um, so I'm really just finishing up the same things as before, right? A two one, right? This this is uh, corresponds to the correct value, the Riemann sum, even though they haven't simplified it. We we didn't ask for that. Um, this one, right? So that idea they have to have earned the two previous points to be eligible, right? That's a one zero. Um, similarly, I think all the rest of these, right? They didn't earn the first two points, so they they don't earn the answer point. All right, there we go. First snippet. Ah, oops, sorry, sorry people. <laughs> Can try again. All right, good. This is an example of where they can earn all the points with just this expression. So they do have a sum of products, no need to simplify, it is a two one. On this one, Alex, we are allowing an F, correct? Yeah, we landed. I was just thinking about that. We were really uh, kind of careful about Fs last time in the previous right. part. So um, I think we're either that or it's <laughs> one out of two zero, <laughs> right? Right. Normally, you know, they'll take the F, but because we were so strict on the on the other one, it makes me rethink it. Yeah. So yeah. we'll say you're correct if you said either one of those, and there would have been more discussion to really make a decision. Yeah. And it, it is important, it would be a zero. They, they can't earn it. If, if they don't have the first two, they're not eligible for that last one. So that those are the only two. I, I think um, no matter what we decided to do with F, that would be something to be careful about and, and hold to. Yes. So on this one, they're allowed to factor out the three that leaves it as a sum of products. But if we look closely, 15.8 is not what we're looking for. So we're going to say that's a one mistake. So one out of two and they are, cannot earn the last point zero.
you have a snippet going on that one, Aaron? Yeah, he's got the poll. Okay. Oh, okay. Just started. Yeah. So this is a student who had correct and then decided to simplify. So they were simplified wrong. So they cannot earn the answer point. So it's a two zero. And then the last one. Oh, thank you. Here's the Fs again. Think about if we did allow Fs. Okay, on this one, let's say we did allow Fs, but then they rewrote another F and there's another mistake with the 6.3. So that's two mistakes right here. So we're gonna do zero out of two, zero. And if that had been C's and they'd done the C that way, also it'd still be a zero or two zero. Well, they if if they had this line. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That would have that would have gotten the two points. Yes. Yeah, if that would only earn. If, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I messed up my box. Yeah. So if they had C's, it'd be a two out of two zero. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, the only question we have is. How strict are we on using equal signs versus approximately equal signs for real terms? I think we, we accept both. Um, That's what they tell me when I go. Yeah, the, it's, it's one of those things again where um, some, some equals can start to look a lot like approximately and we don't want to be making that careful judgment call. I mean, it really is approximately, but um, I've got a good question here that I see from someone about inoculations. Let's say that we didn't allow Fs mm -hmm. and we dinged them for the F in the mean value theorem problem. Will we double ding them again? The double ding. <laughs> yeah. I, now I think about it, probably not. That might be the type where we'd say you, you will take it, you lose that point once and then we'll read with you. It's a good question. I think that would be a place for uh, some careful discussion, right? In in uh, in the mean value theorem part, if they were just writing things like f of b minus f of a over b minus a that look purely formulaic, which would be different than they're working with f of our points and they they appear to rename the function. So there there probably be a little bit of a boundary about um, allowing them to use. All right, we just got one more part here, right? So um, we've given ourselves a model 16 minus 16 e to the negative 0.5 t, called it d of t. Um, and then we're supposed to explain why the amount of coffee in the cup is increasing. So we're gonna be looking for our ninth point, it's a derivative, and then we'll be looking for some kind of explanation. So, so for our derivative, so I repeated the function, the model here. For our derivative, we'll be looking for them to, well, Compute the derivative. They, they may or may not simplify. It's for any correct presentation of that derivative. Um, it doesn't have to be labeled. Um, they can present simplified work without preceding work. If, but if, if there's arithmetic or algebraic errors, right, if they get this first expression and it turns out to have a minus eight, they, they will not earn the point. Um, we are going to allow both x's and t's for independent variables in this context. It's similar to what we've done before. Um, so the 10th point, the explanation point, um, we're not, we're not going to let them just explain anything. We're going to have a little bit of a criteria on, on eligible D primes um, because we actually need to reference the sign of the derivative. And the two that we're going to look at are plus or minus 8e to the negative 0.5t and plus or minus 32e to the negative 0.5t. Um, the thinking was there, they, they need to do something with the half up in that exponent, right? the, the negative one half. And, and maybe there's errors working with the half, maybe there's errors working with the negative, um, but you can't do both, but you have to have done something. We can't be staying with 16. 
Um, and so, so this winds up splitting into the two cases of, well, what if d prime is a positive 8 e to the negative 0.5 t or a positive 32 e to the negative 0.5 t? Um, right, the, the, the person who's, who's in this case has earned the first point, the person here has not, he made some kind of error, but, but they're still eligible for that 10th point. Um, and they have to state d prime is positive on that interval. So how can you do that? Um, you can use words, you can use symbols, you're allowed to abbreviate. Um, if they reference the interval, we're, we're not gonna be, we're gonna be generous in reading parentheses versus square brackets. Um, if they did, they're also allowed to just say always positive, positive for all reals, or right, there might be other versions of that. But, but that being said, right, we're, we are looking for an interval analysis. You can't just look at a couple points and say, oh, that means it's increasing. Um, so that, that won't be sufficient. Um, so, so how does it change if we have the negatives, right? And still we'll be talking about decreasing. It really reads very parallel. So we can use words, symbols, abbreviations, um, but, but everything will be working in the negative context. They can talk about it always being negative or negative for all reals. Um, Again, the intervals can, can have uh, appear open or closed or neither. Um, I use the word appear intentionally, um, and a point-wise analysis just is not sufficient. All right. Okay, snip land. First snip, home stretch. All right, this student has found the correct derivative. No need to simplify, that's one. And they say that that's always positive. We said we'll allow that, so one, one. And part of what's going on there is, is again, that, that there's the interval reference in the stem of the question, right? That um, we're gonna go ahead and, oops, ah, sorry. Let me, let me pull up a different one, this one. If you look down on the question, right, it talks about increasing for, we've limited their world to that zero to nine. So, okay, next one. All right, so this student has chose to simplify the derivative correctly, but then they do the point analysis. This is a student that wants to thinks the only numbers between zero and nine are the integers, and they'll either test the endpoints or all of those and say they're all positive. That is not good enough. They need to say the whole interval. So this is a one zero. All right, this one's a little tricky. We, we noticed that they said the derivative, but that is not the correct derivative. So that's a zero. It's also not one of the forms we said that's eligible to earn the next point. So while they said D prime is always negative, so the coffee is decreased. If that had been one of our four eligible forms, they would have gotten the one, but that is not one of our eligible forms. So that's gonna be a zero, zero. Last one. All right, this student found the correct derivative, chose to simplify, did it correctly, and then they state, so always increasing. The question is, why is it always increasing? How do you know? They didn't tell us, so this is a one zero. All right, Aaron, any questions on those? 
Uh, only one, uh, I think back on your first SNP, or it might have been in the eligibility points, if they had for D prime, negative 32E to the negative 0.5T, is that, does that count as one or two mistakes? If they have, say, say it again. Is the, the, the one there on the, on the screen there, negative 32E to the negative 0.5T, would that be two mistakes or just one? That would not, the negative 32, okay. go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I'd say it is two mistakes, right? They mess up the negative and they mess up the one half. And so that's, 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 a, that's a great question, right? Is that too many mistakes? Um, I, I think when we were drafting this last week, it was like, we'll let them mess up with either one of those and in both. Um, that, that might be too generous. It might be a place where um, this, this, uh, this one here <laughs> would be removed and we just say, no, you can only make a mistake with a negative or a mistake with a half and not both. And that, I think we talk about that. Yeah. All right, so good, good point there. And then- Can you go uh, back up to the scoring guide real quick for C? For C? Uh, C, yeah. Okay. I asked people to see, make this correction, I'm sorry. Someone noticed it. All right, yes, small typo. There should be a DT after the C of T. Ah. And on the scoring guide, they would use approximately, though we would accept both. Sorry, I just want to make sure everyone had that correct. And yeah. That. Bound to be an error somewhere. <laughs> and, and then someone asked, can the second derivative test be used? For, okay, all right, so we're back to uh, part D. Um, the second derivative test is a test for a local max or min, so I don't know what it would be used for. Okay. Maybe they're talking about concavity test, but not needed. And that was all. Yeah, okay. What well, one of the thing that's like just to, we already talked about it, but just to make sure people know it's relevant, right? Decimal presentation errors have become even more significant in this play, right? There's all kinds of one, two, three decimal right, approximations along the way. So this the same rules would apply. And students could uh, right if you're sitting there grading your student's paper, you're gonna look at A B one and maybe A B two, like you know, do it all at once. They they really can earn a point in both if they make decimal errors in both. Um, so all right. that's what we have. All right, let me uh, share my screen here with you for a second. Okay. Do I have to turn myself off or? Uh, I thought you should that there. All right, you all see that screen right now? Yes? Yeah. All right, so again, th thank you, Alex. Thank you, Michael. Excellent job. I, I think that this should give everybody that watched just a, a little bit of a glimpse into what goes into not just creating a briefing, but also um, from a reader perspective of what they can expect from um, you know a, a typical AP reading, even though it's going to be quite different this year. Um, so just to recap, all of our contact information is on this page here. Um, if you have questions for any of us, feel free to email us directly. We will get back to you. We will update all of our briefing presentation notes, slides, samples, scoring guidelines to the Google uh, Drive, the bit.ly, um, by the end of the day or first thing in the morning. Um, handouts again, all of that in the bit.ly link. We'll also post today's recording to the KYAP 2020 website as well. Um, tomorrow, for your students, um, we have Tony Record joining us, who's been doing the AP uh, live sessions for BC. He's going to join us for an AB session for students at 1 p.m. tomorrow. So students, uh, go have your students go register. They can do that at the KYAP 2020 website. Um, it should be a really informative session. Uh, Tony presented for us at Fall Forum this past year, and he did an incredible job. And I know he's been doing a really good job with these uh, YouTube sessions. So. Um, Please check that out if, if you have students that want to get some last minute preparation in for the AP exam. Uh, just a couple more questions. Um, if students go to more than three decimals, is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Regardless of accuracy? It can be incorrect and it's still okay. We read the first three. And yeah, then three. someone else asked, do we know if this is how the scoring is going to go for the exam? Are they changing the scoring? Um, and then how, what, what are your comments on converting scores to a one, two, five, one, one through five? We've speculated about as far as we feel comfortable speculating is, 
is the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I, I think the uh, AP ETS doesn't want radical shifts, right? And this is just me speaking as Alex McAllister, right? I mean, a lot of effort you've invested and your students invested over the years, and these these kind of guidelines for grading are, are pretty carefully thought about. And sometimes there's shifts, but um, I wouldn't expect it to be radically different. I have no clue what questions they're going to ask, right? To go from all the multiple choice and six questions down to a couple. That's a really big change. I'm sure that test development committee is cranking away at it, trying to figure out the good answers. Um, yeah, I'd say something about a misconception that I know I, some teachers had, I had, is I think a lot of people think the scores are evenly distributed, kind of normalized. And they're not, it is absolutely possible, not probable, that every student got a five. That it could, it's possible. They get what they earn. It, it just, the way things fall, it looks like a normal curve. But not so much BC though. If you look at BC, it tends not to be a normal curve. There's higher amounts of fours and fives, but every student could get a four or five. It's not a preset amount. I think, I think another thing I can mention too is in terms of like, I, I have nothing to do with how scores are determined. So I, I really don't know at all how to suggest what, what our 25 points would turn into as far as a score. Um, I think another kind of piece to it is we, we had a, like we wrote up these questions. We had this conversation of like, like this, uh, the last question on AB1 with taking a derivative and finding the tangent line. We kind of thought about like, well, should we like really crank out a super hard question there? Um, I, you know, would AP do that? I don't know. Um, we were thinking of this more as partly a, let's give a good flavor and intention, but also not to be a, a soul crushing experience for any student out there. Um, things that would stretch them, be really valuable skills that we believe they need to know. Um, and, and so there might be a couple places where some of this is easier than, than what they're going to land on. I don't know if you, you have a sense of that, Michael or Aaron. Or... Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, and I, I think a takeaway too is this experience really was for you, the teacher, because yes, this year is different and we all are wondering what it's gonna be like, but next year, hopefully we're back to how we've been doing things and these are common things you see and common ways that they're graded. And I would just say, if you've not applied to be a reader, I encourage you to do so. It's the best professional development you'll ever have and it'll change the way you teach um, because you'll know what, what they're looking for. And it's so much more than just a scoring guide you see posted. Yeah, and you know, I, I think everybody saw that just with the discussion that could be had you know, with, with all just how those scoring guidelines are set. So uh, really good insights. Uh, someone else asked about the, the BC scoring session on Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. Um, register for that the same way you register for this one. I know that the AB1 question is the same as the BC1 question. So um, to save you all the time that are also in here already that will be joining us for BC, we will be beginning that session with uh, BC2. And then we will move to AB1 or point you in the direction of the recording, either one. Um, but we will begin with BC2, which hopefully will give us the opportunity to do some live student scoring that we did not have time to do today. Um, and the Tony record session is for students. All of our review sessions that have happened up till now are recorded and posted on KYEP 2020, but we do have an AB session for students um, tomorrow. We have a BC session for students on Thursday. So um, we, right, right here this week before the exam, we, we've got some last minute review for everybody. So teachers are obviously welcome to attend, but it, but it is geared towards students, but that doesn't mean that uh, teachers can't ask questions as well. So. But just last thought, I love the chat questions. People have thrown in here, y'all asking great questions and just a big shout out and thanks in the midst of all the stuff that's going on, the transitions we've all had to make in our teaching. Um, I've, I've just heard about heroic efforts by so many of you just to say thanks for all you're doing for our students to help them learn calculus and, and do well with life. So, yeah. So yes, all, all, all sessions, including today's, as well as all student sessions, will be posted to KYAP 2020. So check that out, um, along with handouts. We have handouts for all the sessions as well. So um, Alex, Michael, any closing, uh, any other closing words? If not, we will go ahead and uh, sign off. We went a little into overtime, but I, I think it was worthwhile. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it. Right. Have a great afternoon.